Fuck. God. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm horny as hell. Okay, so... Anyone hear that? Oh, yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. Was I just thinking that will be edited right. out. <laughs> you should start it there. Just start it right there with that. Uh, we may actually do that. <laughs> God, I'm horny as hell. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode five of I Don't Give a Flick. I am your host, Johnny Blackburn. Uh, and alongside with me always is my co-host... Gary Elmore. Gary, welcome back. Back. I'm glad you were able to make it today. Yes, yes. Uh, I actually... Um, well, we're filming from my house, and... Oh! Yeah, I, I live here, so... No, like, we're actually... No, not your house. No. We are actually recording from the 32nd floor of Rockefeller Center. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. So that was a heck of a drive from Austin, Texas. I mean, it really was, you know, but with my private airliner, it was a mere three and a half hours. So. Right. Made the trip... Is that why we got a 30-minute delay starting? Yes, yes, because it was that extra half hour. You know, Gary just has to get those street vendor hot dogs yeah they are and delicious. we couldn't find anybody for obvious reasons you know there's there's no one out on the streets right now from from coronavirus going on so two months in and and we're still uh we're still quarantined so hopefully that ends sooner rather than later anyways uh today we'd like to welcome back our good friend ian webb uh one of the hosts of the podcast movies so bad they're good and the Facebook group, Movies So Bad They're Good, Midnight Cult Classics, and Camp. Ian, welcome back. Yo. Hey, man. How's, uh, how you been? How's, uh, I, I gotta ask, how's quarantine treating you? I mean, it's different from uh, a couple weeks ago when you were last on, so. Uh, no, it's the same. It's the same, okay. <laughs> I, I'm really impressed that you got that correct, Johnny. Good job. Thank you. Well, yeah. I actually had it, uh, I r wrote it out this time. Oh, So okay. I, I typed it down. If, you, if you'll notice, for those of you that have listened to prior uh, episodes of ours, I've mentioned the podcast and Facebook group that Ian uh, hosts a couple times, and I've gotten it wrong in two podcasts now and had to correct <laughs> myself both times. So, oh, you didn't know about the second time because you weren't on with no. us. Well... Well, good. Uh, Just ignore you know. it then. Yeah. So now, now you messed up by not messing up. Oh, damn it. Oh. Anyways, well, uh, you, you know, you. you know what? I just have to say that I am happy that the theaters right now are taking the big budget movies that were supposed to come out in you know the everyday average theaters at AMC, Cinemark, whatever, and they're they're playing them directly into your home now or giving you the option to do it, but. It's just not the same. It's just not the same. Yeah. You know, um, I, I I tried to watch a couple of the new releases recently. Like Trolls 2 or Aren't whatever you? that one was? <laughs> uh, Hell I didn't, yeah. I didn't watch Trolls 2. Didn't watch Trolls 2. Um, but, you know, I tried to watch, um, oh God, what was it? The Hunt? That new one that was uh, that, oh, new, yeah. that, really, that, yeah. that new political one where mm -hmm. it's basically making fun of uh, everybody on both sides of the aisle and you know telling everyone to quit be quit being so serious. Um, actually, you know, produced by Jason Blum and, and Blumhouse uh, Productions, where they typically stick with um, horror films. But anyways, you know, seeing it, yeah, we'll go into another podcast about that later. But I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting film, all in all. But the fact that I had to watch it at home, it really. It really brought me down a little bit, you know. The the experience it wasn't yeah. there. I wasn't able to see it on the big screen. It was. It's one of those movies that you know. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of gore. There's a lot of. There's a lot of chases and a lot of mystery. And it, it's just not as fun. Are you Are you an extrovert, Johnny? No. No. Okay. No. And I don't think. And I think all okay. of our listeners can tell that I'm not. Right. Yeah. You know. I really just. I really Stay just hide home. in my shell. Just a homebody. I am a homebody. Okay. What can I say? Anyways. Uh, <laughs> Transitioning from transitioning from that, the directors right now that have shaped American cinema over the last forty and fifty years should be given a round of applause. Uh, I'm just going to give them a round of applause right now. You know, we're just going to give a round of applause to uh, directors everywhere because yeah. they are they're the they're the guys that that make the movies go, as well as the crew, the actors, and the producers, of course. And I also got but, uh, my mark for editing this, so that worked out really well. You, you know? did, yeah, the clap. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you did. You're very welcome for uh -huh. that. Yeah, post is just as important as, as everything else. As Tarantino says, it, film is a three part. He, do, he doesn't say fix it in post. We're no. not going to say that. No, um, we if, would never if say that. If you've ever been on a film set before and you you know you think that something can be fixed in post uh it can't 
Okay. Yeah. Normally, you know, 85% of the time, no. No, take the time to get it right because you're going to regret yeah. it later. It's and much it, easier. It doesn't matter if it's a short film, a music video, a commercial, a feature, a document. It doesn't matter. Fix it then. Okay? Find a way. Reshoot it. Go back. You know, do, use one of your, your rainy day backup days and, mm-hmm. and, and go back and do it again. Uh, anyways, I'm getting a little off topic. Today's topic Just a is uh, Gary, Ian, and I are going to go straight up classic debate style, and we are going to debate the greatest Hollywood directors of all time and also the most overrated Hollywood directors of all time. Uh, I'm really excited for this one because we each, even though we all have pretty, we have similar tastes in some of the movies that we enjoy, the other side of us. Right has very dissimilar tastes, very uh, stark contrast in uh, the type of directors and films that we uh, hold dear to our hearts. Uh, now, Johnny, you told me that we were going to be debating the merits of a progressive tax system and the vices of it as well, so yes. I'm not as quite as prepared as I would have okay. liked to have been. Well, I figured we could do that, okay. but I didn't want to put our listeners to sleep. Fair enough. Or into you know a self-induced <laughs> three-year coma okay. because of how boring and Look, tax and law is sounds, very fascinating. That's great. Let me tell you. I'm bored already, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ian's like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm done, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm passing out. I'm, I'm already. I'm faded as, I'm faded as fuck, and I'm not even smoking anything. Um, <laughs> Ian, let's start with you, man. Uh, favorite director of all time. I know we kind of talked about this a little bit beforehand, but our listeners don't know. So, who is your favorite director of all time? The one you consider to be the most influential to the movies that you really love and you really dig. Man, this was a hard one because I there's so many. I I, I was gonna go with Coen Brothers. I mm-hmm. was gonna go with Martin Scorsese, but I I have to give it up to Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick, all right, all right, okay, all right, and and an oldie but an oldie but a goodie, an oldie but a goodie. Okay, um, what so from Kubrick? What are your three favorite films Ooh, that he, that okay. he's done? Three favorites. So you don't have to do your your number one, but your top three probably. Just to practice yeah. all this. Uh, I'll tell you straight up, my my favorite movie of all time is 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, God. This is going to be And really you were bored debate. by my tax sermon that I was just giving? I don't know. Gary, you might be right. That's, <laughs> they both, both, my, both of those things can put me to sleep. All right, Ian. Uh, why, why is 2001 Space Odyssey your favorite movie of all time? Yeah. You said why? Yeah, why? Like, I mean, what, what do you oh, love so much about it? it? It's, it's so visual and... Yeah, especially at the time it came out, uh, sure. like I, I've seen it in the movie theater twice on uh, IMAX. Oh, okay, that would be yeah. a good way to watch it. That could be interesting. That's yeah, the best never... way to watch it. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it was like no, no, wait, 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 wait. I take that back. I've seen it three times on, on in the theater, not IMAX though. But oh. it was uh, yeah, my bad. It wasn't IMAX. It was seventy millimeter all three times for seventy millimeter. Okay, and it was film. You know, like it, it was the way it was made to to be watched you know it was all gritty film that was 30 years old it was but it was so incredible but yeah it's it's so very visual and the the sound effects too were just incredible like you know it's just nothing but just darkness the first couple minutes of the movie and you just hear that that really eerie sound and then there's no dialogue for the next 30 minutes is is completely groundbreaking and sure. then, you know, the thing at the end, and you, you watch it so many times, you still aren't completely sure what's going on. That's very true. I, I can, I can <laughs> yeah. attest to that one. I definitely don't know what's going on when I watch it. And there's so many mm. spoofs and parodies of that movie. Yeah. I mean, just... Yeah, it, it's like, how can it not be one of the best movies of all time? I, I can I can give you a couple solid reasons, but I, I want I do want to stick to, <laughs> to the director. So, so look, here's, here's my thing with it. As far as it being a groundbreaking... Uh, baking, a groundbreaking transcendent film to transition from the era of the studio system from the early 1960s to the European art uh, you know, influenced world of, of where film became, definitely 2001. I mean, I, I would probably agree with you and go as, go as far to say that, you know, it, it was the most influential film, you know, outside of maybe Absolutely. The Psycho or, you know, like the, when Hitch, you know, Hitchcock's time, you know, um, yeah. uh, what was it? Not Stranger in the Window, Rear Window. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it definitely... I think a lot of the things you're talking about, I, I don't know. See, and here's here's my thing. I don't know enough about the background to say this is all Kubrick or this is all 
but a collaboration of him and the, the post-production supervisor great. and the guy, uh-huh. the, his composer. And so, like, and granted, you know, a director is only as good as, as the team he puts around him, for sure. You know, it's a, it's a Steve Jobs kind of thing, you know, you, or you orchestrate and you manage the, the artistic vision. But a lot of things you're saying to me are technical things, and I'm just like, okay, well, that's that's really awesome, you know, like, you know, Star Wars was groundbreaking for its special effects at the time, but, you know, how mm-hmm. much influence did George Lucas really but have on it, that? It, it's so interesting, because, uh, you know, if you look at the special effects of uh, 2001, and I think that came out in 66? 68. 68. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they're actually probably better than Star Wars, which came out, you know, nine yeah. years later. I just would give you Because, that, I yeah. mean, like, if if you watch the original one before George Lucas modified it, we'll say, um, the original Star Wars, uh, you know, the special effects aren't yeah, so great. It, it, was, it was pretty rough. Yeah. Sure. But, um, like... Uh, 2001 uh, looks like it was made a couple years ago. Yeah. I mean, it looks pristine and polished, and um, yeah. it, it's very interesting because uh, yeah. Kubrick, uh, in that movie... Um, you know, everything was very clean and ordered, you know, and you contrast that with, like, his, um... There's no The mess. Shining. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, with, with that movie, and I'd say also Clockwork Orange, and, uh, have you seen Larry Bend or... Benden, Larry, Larry I don't Benden. think I've even heard of that. Yeah, that it, it, yeah it's, 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 it came out between 2001 and Clockwork Orange. Like, okay, so it was between 16 and It's not and very well known, but that movie, uh-huh. it's like, what's so amazing about Kubrick is that movie is so slow. Like, if you think 2001 is slow-paced, Larry mm-hmm. Benden is so much more slow-paced. <laughs> but it's like... Hey, some people love that. It, I mean, some people love a good, yeah. a good long sleep. <laughs> yep. but what, what's great about it is that it, it's like a painting that moves basically that that's what he's doing he, he's painting a picture okay and the picture moves and uh especially with larry benden like each each scene each frame mm-hmm. is just one solid picture that is just still every frame tells that, a story yeah that's great yeah exactly and then there's like slight movement Okay, so I uh, I, I yeah. guess with no no I mean I and I agree with you, you know between between two thousand one between a Clockwork Orange you know between uh, Doctor Strange Love you know um, those those types of movies in that time period yeah you know the the artistic the artistic portions that they they took and the artistic direct direction license that they took with those were. I mean, you could say they were they were beautiful. They were that oh, portion yeah, was a masterpiece. Absolutely, I think absolutely, St- Stanley yeah. Kubrick very much. Um, you know, you can definitely tell his influence on the movies that he does because sure. they have a a very very strong vision and a a feel to them. And yeah. they're not all the same feel, but you know, you, you can tell that Stanley Kubrick's uh, thought about a lot of these things before the movies even you know, yeah, come into play. Very, very much. so. Uh, yeah, in Doctor Strange Love, the the green table was a, he had to get the right shade of green, even though the movie was in black and white. Right. Yeah. And you can't tell, but it had to be the right mm-hmm. shade of green. You, you know what I I really love uh, about him in Clockwork Orange. Mm-hmm. You know the very first scene, uh-huh. the, the introduction where it, the, it shows milk scene. Alex's face. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it starts out a very extreme close up, which is. Not a lot of directors like doing that because it's you know they call it extreme close up for a reason. It's, it's so extreme, and then the camera pans out and then it reveals, it, like first you just see Alex, then it reveals his gain of droogs, then it keeps zooming out and then you see the table that's two naked ladies. Then it keeps zooming out and you see more of that. And then it's just the more it zooms out, the more it reveals to you. And then all of a sudden it's an extreme far away shot. Yeah. And so every every second is revealing more and more. And it tells you exactly what this movie is about. Yeah. And it tells a story without needing any words or even any yeah. actions. You know, it's it sets the entire tone of 
uh, what the next? How, how long is that movie? Two and, and a half I've, hours. I've yeah. never seen that before in any other movie. But Just it's it's, how a, it's, it's an art show. A... It's an art exhibit at that point. It's not. I, I don't know. And, and like and for for anybody listening to this, and even for us, this is obviously all subjective. You know, it's like your criteria for a for the for a great director is probably different from mine. You know, or different from Gary's. Um, you know, or vice versa. But mm-hmm. for me. Uh, the director's job is yes, the the framing and the coloring and the influence of positioning and timing of sound effects, the type of sound effects, the music composition, what you're using, that all has an effect on the mood. But the singular most important aspect is the storyline and how you tell it and how you pace it in the editing and the direction of the film. And so for 2001, for Clockwork Orange, even for Dr. Strangelove, um, even for something like Eyes Wide Shut or something like that, uh, for me... Very underrated movie. And, so. and it was it was an underrated movie. And I'm not saying I, I don't... 2001 is probably my least favorite of his, which, uh, sorry, really? but it, it is. Um, I forget. They're, ju- <laughs> they're just too... For, for me personally, they're just... They're, they're too slow and they're too focused on the visual medium. And I feel like... That is only a small portion of what a great film should be, and that's just my own personal opinion. So the, sh- the and it's sh- okay to be wrong, Johnny. <laughs> I, I I'd say that a lot of people would agree with me, but that's that's just that's just one we'll find humble out. critic's opinion. If you like it, like us in the comments below. Yeah. <laughs> if you dislike it, dislike it below. Um, you know, I mean, no, the the Shining and uh, you know, the Spartacus Full Metal Full Metal Jacket, jacket right? Yeah. Um, those ones. They had they stuck more the shiny in particular, which is one of my that's one of my top twenty five favorite movies of all time kind of thing, um, because but, it has the number one rated actor. No, of all time it has a it. top five rated actor. <laughs> hey, we did it by the numbers. It was Jack. Oh, Nicholson. oh you're talking about as as far as our quantitative data <laughs> yes, goes. Okay. Yes, yes. So you're you're, you're, right. you're proving to me that Kubrick's the best. Thank you. All right. Because <laughs> yeah, well, the one movie he had with Jack Nicholson. I don't know about that. Um, no, look, I I I do like Stanley Kubrick a lot. Don't get me wrong. Um, I I think that a lot of the he he definitely. He blazed the way for a lot of filmmakers now. I think a lot of filmmakers now, and we'll get to one of our most overrated directors a little later on, Gary's in particular, which is also one of mine, but Gary grabbed it first. Um, some people take too much artistic license now, and they focus solely on the film being you know, symbolic and just pretty. And oh, yeah. to me, that is the biggest downfall that a director can have coming in with that mindset for the film. I'm not saying Kubrick did that. I, I get films. what you're saying. So it's I, just me. I get what you're you saying. Know, I mean, but, he, you know, definitely. I, I think he's very unique. Uh-huh. No, that's true. Yeah, that's, um, I'll give you that. And, uh, like, yeah, it's... it's he, but, I mean, he, he's making his movies for all the same reasons. It's not, it's not just, this is pretty, so pay me money. Sure. He's like Bernie and, Sanders. And, he, stray, he stays... He does stay true to his word. I'm not a huge fan of Bernie, yeah, but it's I'll the be, same thing. He stays... It's the same... He's, he has he had the same idea and the same structure of how he go, goes about things for decades, and he, he does. He's, he's an artist that it, it, instead of paint, he uses film. Right, and sure. I, I will also give him credit that he has you know a wide ver- variety of storytelling mechanisms. So if yeah, you look, I was about to get to that too. Oh, yeah, go, exactly. go ahead then. Yeah, he's your uh, guy. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, each each movie is a different genre. Mm-hmm. Which is very hard to pull off to do a different genre for each film. Like Eyes Wide Shut, uh, like a whodunit noir kind of thing. Uh, you know, Shining is horror. 2001 is uh, sci fi. Clockwork Orange is a thriller kind of thing. Psychological thriller. Yeah. Musical. In a way. Yeah. Get yeah, musical. <laughs> yeah. Kinda, there, there are a couple musical uh, Doctor Strange Strangelove is a comedy. Yeah. Yeah, kind of, um, I think they're they're all kind, of, but they and you're right. They all they all stick to that film noir genre, though, like a little bit in every one of those films you just named. Not that their main genre is, but it's kind of a secondary thing that yeah. that's. It seems to me that's what Kubrick's calling card is: is the the film noir and you know the really obscure, outside the box thinking films, which it that resonates with a lot of people, you know. Um, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, I was just going to say also that he, um, you know, you, you look at like 2001 or A Clockwork Orange, and those are very, very tight stories, meaning that they're really just focused on one character. And then you kind of like, he's he can also do like The Shining, which is kind of focused on three or four characters. Um, and then like, uh, like Dr. Strangelove is just a bunch of dis- 
not disconnected, but um, spread out storylines. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's kind of unusual to see. And I think that speaks to his accomplishments. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I you know, and I I have to agree. He definitely, definitely, you know, one of the not only one of the most notable directors of all time, but definitely one of the most influential, especially for now. Because can you think of? I'm sure there were a few European directors before the 1960s that influenced Kubrick, or the 1950s, I guess, when he started. Um, but can you name another director that has influenced so many directors now? Even if I personally don't like those types of movies mm-hmm. as much, um, like. Yeah, the ones we'll get into later, but no, for sure. Um, no, I, I, it's a, that's, that's, that's a good pick. You know, I mean, I think that you can go, I'm glad you went with him and not the Coen brothers. Cause I think with, with him, you can go a little deeper and yeah. there's a little more to dissect and it's, it's just, it's makes for better conversation. Yeah, he's a lot more unique. Too, he is. Like I was saying. That's very true. Uh, Gary, what about you? Favorite director of all time? Uh, well, I really thought about this one for a lot, long time. And, uh, I think that I'm going to have to go with Mr. Steven Spielberg on that. Oh, so come on. That's yeah. like saying my favorite football player of all time is Tom Brady or my favorite basketball player is Michael <laughs> Jordan. Well, if you like, like winning, yeah, I guess. So, no, but like Steven Spielberg. Such a bandwagoner. Um, Steven Spielberg, <laughs> maybe like 20 years. Anyway, so Steven Spielberg, um, in addition to making some of my favorite films, um, yeah. he's just got such a great eye for figuring out how to direct um, and a lot of that also goes back to, I think, choosing the right team. Um, you know, working with uh, John Williams is always a great idea. Uh, but like no duh. <laughs> when when he shot uh, Jurassic Park, um, so most action movies are shot in a, a, a wider kind of lens. Um, but he chose a, like a taller, narrower lens to shoot it uh, to capture the, the height and the majesty of the dinosaurs. And I don't know if that's something that you know, comes natural to people that have been doing this a long time. Like, you know, you think about like Alfred Hitchcock and all of the very interesting and wonderful choices that he made while directing, you know, but like those kind of small, subtle changes tell the story of the movie in a completely different way. So instead of having a uh, fast, you know, horizontal movement, you've got this grandiose uh, vertical movement from Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jurassic Park, I think, is one of the finest uh, films of the 90s and probably of all time because there's just so many, you know, wonderful elements. I mean, who, you know, when they're watching the movie isn't emotionally uh, engrossed by it. Um, but, you know, he, he's done some movies that I, I'm not a huge fan of, like uh, E.T. I know that's a really, really popular one. Oh, dude, but, man, get yeah, out of here, man. But E.T. E. for me is <laughs> just, <laughs> just <laughs> you know. Johnny, are you just going to uh, disagree oh, yeah. with everything? Yeah, it's a debate. Much, what yeah. am I supposed to do? Just sit here and be like, mm-hmm, oh, you're very interesting. I concur. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, but like, uh, I, I think also, like, the movie Jaws was a really interesting story. That was kind yeah. of his first big movie and it was the the first uh blockbuster movie of all time mm. and just I, I love hearing you know people recount that because there's so many issues that they had and they had to work through and those became a part of the story like having issues with the the mechanical shark uh that was playing jaws and you know how that affected not seeing him the the shark very much until the very end like i i think those are just just great stories and i think steven spielberg is a phenomenal storyteller um because you look at the range of his work i mean he's got uh you know in sort of an adventure movie like uh, jurassic park uh he's got you know a drama like schindler's list he's got a war movie like um uh saving Saving prior yeah thank you thank you um, which I think forget that to, one. to this day has probably one of the best uh, Normandy invasion shots of any movie of all time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Abs- absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, some of his, like, he did um, uh, Ready Player One. Yeah, uh, Ready Player One recently, which uh, was... Yeah, I didn't like that one. No, <laughs> and that was that was just kind of a, a money grab but yeah, that was definitely. I thought it was good, good, but I had never read the original <laughs> book, so <laughs> but, so yeah. so that so here so here's my thing, and just for the sake of the debate, it, it's hard to to poke holes in a director as accomplished as Steven Spielberg, right? You know, yeah. it, it, it is, and I can. 
I got two holes. What okay. you got? All right. Well, okay. Let's start out with you then. Go ahead. What are your two holes? What are you? What are you? Po- what are you poking at Spielberg? Let's, let's pop this balloon. Yeah. It's okay. Go uh, ahead. No, I, I, I've been begging to say this. So I have two problems with them. His okay. movies are too wholesome. Okay. <laughs> A lot of them and, are. Okay. And they're uh, they're too family oriented. It's all about the family. Well, so let me let me let me, let me pose this back to you then. Um, if, like. Is that wholesomeness and uh, family orientedness uh, that you're talking about? Is that something that's part of the story, or do you feel like that's being interjected in, into the story, modifying okay, yeah. it? Yeah, and, and a lot of times, yeah, it, it's, it's take um, shit. What's it called? The the one with the aliens. Close Encounters. Uh, AI. No, 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 no. Artificial <laughs> intelligence. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, War of the Worlds. Well, actually, that one right there. Yeah, is uh, brilliant story. Also, was going to be a Kubrick movie. Right. Yeah, because yeah. they were and, they were good friends. And, and then yeah, and, and so it's all about yeah how incredible realistic this AI robot is, and he's just trying to find his mom the whole movie. That kind of. I yeah, don't know. for for the for the, for the a little bit for me. Sure, for sure. for the listeners that don't know, uh, Steven Spielberg and Stanley Kubrick were really good friends. Uh, Stanley Kubrick was going to direct this movie called AI, but he passed away before he could do it. Um, so Steven Spielberg, um, this isn't firsthand knowledge. I don't know Steven Spielberg, but this is what <laughs> I've heard. Um, then stepped in to direct the movie, and he tried to direct it as Stanley Kubrick would have. Um, yeah, that's which, true. I've heard that. Yeah, which did not work out as successfully because no. it like Steven Spielberg and Stanley Kubrick have very very different uh, yeah. styles. Really? Yeah, <laughs> no. And, and and kind of going back, Ian, to your point, um, he, at the end of the movie, um, uh, Haley Joe Osment is like alone underwater, basically dying, um, right. and. You can kind of tell the part that Steven Spielberg was like, we need to put a happy ending on this so, you know, kids don't go kill themselves. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's a, the mother. For yeah. Me. yeah. 24 and, hours. And, and yeah. The, the whole the whole movie, the plot was he's trying to find his mom, but there's all this more, more in, like everything that was really interesting about it was outside of that. And right. I wanted more of that. And it is like, I'm, I'm tired of him looking for his mom. But that's not the movie I was talking about. Uh, War with the Worlds. Oh, the remake. Yeah, with Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. um, Like, again, a great story, but it's all centered on Tom Cruise's family that I thought was kind of unnecessary. Well, I I will say that I I think that is a fair assessment to make, but I would make a counter that pretty much um, all stories, like, are centered on, you know, a person and their relationships with people that they're close to. Castaway, I guess, would yeah. be an exception. Um, but um, <laughs> well, no, even Wilson. Castaway with Wilson. Yeah, oh, yeah. So yeah, you, you make a relationship if you don't have one. So I mean, I I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm not sure I would say that is a a fair critique to make because it's not like everything's being altered for that. But I will say that I don't think Steven Spielberg would make a movie that was as dark as Stanley Kubrick. True, he definitely. So uh, to to agree with. Ian's point to jump on that wagon there is is yeah even his movies that have the potential to go down the really dark and morbid road they typically don't you know even even with something yeah. like shit with Schindler's List with Saving Private Ryan I would say Schindler's with, List was but, but it, c- could you imagine if Stanley Kubrick directed Schindler's List or Quentin Tarantino <laughs> there's no way that movie would have ended like that. there's no way there's no, there's no way they would have shown that l- few amount of people dying there's no way. Right. There's no way. Even tra- even Jurassic Park, if that had been directed by somebody else, mm-hmm. then it it would have been way more violent. It would yeah. have been way but more. It, it would have been the a different book was genre, very violent for sure. Yeah, but yeah. It, it would have been a different. Again, it would have been a different genre would, if somebody had direct. If somebody else had directed. Why it. would it have been a different genre? Because of the rating going up to an R or to a PG thirteen, depending on what the movie Be, was. I think because the. The, a different director like uh, Kubrick. Um, Kubrick would have. I have no idea what he would have focused on if he had directed that. <laughs> but like Tarantino would have definitely focused on like the the violent aspect of it, and there'd have been a lot yeah. more. And like that's that, that that's a story to tell. Uh, that's just not the one that Spielberg chose to tell. True, and it's it goes back to that same thing that I brought up. Is is this all is subjective? Right. You know, like yeah. For 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 me and to for me to an extent and for Gary I know you know typically we like to see some type of resolution at the end of the movie where the the protagonist and 
the side characters that are attached to them learn some valuable type of lesson. It doesn't matter if, you know, they learned it through bloodshed. You know, for me... Yeah, that's like a story arc. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, like, so, you know, I, I would put Saving Private Ryan and Pulp Fiction, two of my favorite movies of all time, both directed by two very different directors on opposite, opposite ends of the spectrum. It 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 did end with, with everybody learning something, even if the lesson wasn't necessarily something you teach your kids mm -hmm. in Tarantino's world, but it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's something you might teach your family in Spielberg's world. So yeah. it, it just depends, well, you know, and I mean, Ian, it doesn't really sound like, you know, you, you, you love Kubrick and who, I, I, you say you love the Coen brothers and stuff. Um, those guys are far cries from the style that Spielberg directs with, you know? So, yeah. I mean, is, well, is Spielberg even in your top five of favorite directors of all time or where would he even rank for you? Uh, I, I'd say no. I mean, he's he's not bad in any. Sure, way. I'm not saying you're saying he's bad. I just uh, pre but personal preference. Where would you put him? I, I, I yeah. I mean, de yeah, definitely not in top five. Like all my top five people are a lot more artistic. Yeah, sure, and that's perfectly and, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I would I would say that's true. And here's my, here's my argument to you because some of some of my favorite films to ever be created are Spielberg films, either directed or produced. Um. But for me, Spielberg was the greatest director in the history of cinema from 1970 to 2000. And then okay, it's gone downhill that. in the last two decades for me. I, yeah. I don't think he's had... He's had a couple of noteworthy films. But for the most part, it's all just like you said. It's money grabs. And yeah. so let, so I'm, I'm just I'm just going over the list of stuff that he's had. Well, so maybe you guys will luck out and West Side Story 2020 will be about violent <laughs> rape gangs I'm that actually, roam the streets. Oh, no, 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 no. Not that far. No, but he's had great. So, uh, you know, catch me if you can. Fantastic. Um, you know, AI, I hated artificial intelligence, honestly. Um, I thought I, Munich was really overrated. I loved the terminal. Um, Lincoln, I thought for Lincoln, you had outside of Daniel Day Lewis and Sally Field, you took the probably one of the most interesting presidents in one of the most interesting times in the history of our country, and the portions that Spielberg and the screenwriter pulled from were some of the most boring parts of his presidency, and I think that's maybe what I personally didn't enjoy about it. Okay, well, um, I, I mean, I don't think the story of that had been... Like, there's a lot of movies about Lincoln, but I don't think they had really necessarily talked about that aspect of him, so, you know, it was trying to, to pull a new kind of point of view to him yeah but it, you know it's like you know you I, I i it's like name another famous figure you know it's like or you take okay you take richard nixon or something and you're just like hmm i'm gonna pull oh let's see i'm gonna pull a bunch of stories and write a screenplay about how nixon campaigned i'd and, watch the and, hell and out of that month, movie. i know you would because you love <laughs> stuff like that but i'm gonna pull you know we're gonna focus on this one month he campaigned in iowa before the caucus and and that's it. That's what the move. That's what the move's about. And that's kind of how it came across to me with the Lincoln story. I don't okay. know. Okay, I mean, right. that's the screenwriter's fault. I, I don't know. Um, but then he had, didn't yeah, the it win Best of, Picture. The Adventures of Rin Tin Tin. Oh. Uh, no, just Daniel Day Lewis won. Uh, it was oh. nominated, but every Spielberg movie is going to be nominated. Um, Minority Report. I thought was okay. Bridge of Spies. I thought was overrated. Um, it's War Horse. I I didn't see that one. The Post was actually was actually pretty good. I thought we saw War Horse together. It was about the horse in World War One. Actually, you know, I I didn't see that with you. I don't. You've said that before, but I, I've never actually seen it before. Is I think the, you it, saw it with Tom, or maybe you saw it with Neil okay. or something. I don't know. Okay, but I didn't see I didn't see it with you. Um, but my point is, you know, with Spielberg, I, I think his his classics where he really reigned supreme was from the time of Jaws to the time of Saving Private Ryan, essentially the, you know, the early 70s yeah. to the late 90s. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, when I watch his movies, I, I think this is great. This is amazing. And, sure. you know, it captures me like that. But none of them really stick with me later. You know, I'm not thinking about them the next day. It's pretty much, all right, well, that's that was great, but that's over. And I'm moving on to this next thing, whereas other movies... Uh, like say David Lynch movies or something like that, yeah. like really stick with me. Okay, so you're not a fan, I guess, of, uh, or I guess you don't rate highly the sort of like the popcorn movies that are just like this is fun. Yeah, to watch. Not really. okay, okay, all right then. It's it's entertaining for entertainment's sake, like that, and that's it. Yeah, okay. but I mean, as far as those movies go, that whole genre, Spielberg is the best of that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You okay. know. 
Well, uh, he's the least lazy, lazy person. Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I, I could. We watched this one master's class on this. I can't remember what his name oh, was. God. And he was like, "It's bumpy." He's to not go. a good teacher. Okay. okay. And oh, this segues, by the way, by the way, Johnny, who's your guy? Oh, for God's sake! Uh, this one was actually not easy because I, you know, I, I had to struggle. You know, I was thinking, okay, uh, Tarantino. I've, I've. There's really no film of his outside recently once upon a time in hollywood and kind of jackie brown that i'm like all right well you know these are these suck no ever i mean reservoir dogs to pulp fiction to django unchained to i've I've always loved tarantino um you know i love uh, david fincher too you know um i mean fight club the social network and seven that's those all three are on my list of top 50s and we'll get to top 50 best movies of all time or favorite ones at some point (laughs) at some podcast um that one could take a while but no, for me it's 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 Scorsese. It's Martin Scorsese. It always has been. Um, I know he gets he Hell gets a, yeah. he gets a rap man for just doing violent, over the top, kind of like Tarantino before Tarantino type oh, he, he's mafia done, he's movies. Done plenty of nonviolent movies. Oh, he's done tons of he. The amount of the broad base of the genres he's jumped into, people don't even realize because the only movies they remember are Goodfellas, The Departed recently the irishman and you know taxi yeah. driver which honestly i think taxi driver was one of his most overrated films it's it it really? it it, it, it oh, sickens man. me to say that but you know i i actually I watched it that. only for the first time a couple and weeks ago I, I didn't see christopher lloyd or danny devito in that at all that's true christopher oh that's lloyd. taxi i'm thinking of <laughs> add, add that joke jesus you just confused me for a we're not talking like, what? Uh, no nick at night <laughs> shit please right now god Thank you very much. That's for um, you older folks out there. <laughs> so Hopefully you, they're you watching say, and not caring that we're dropping the F-bomb every two words. Well, especially if we're talking about Scorsese. Exactly. You know, um, uh, Excuse me, fucking Scorsese. Yeah, fucking Scorsese. Um, I think, yeah, the, in, in, in Goodfellas, um, I think they, they dropped the F-bomb. Goodfellas is one of the best movies of all time. Goodfellas is my favorite movie of all time. Highly Hans- overrated. Not Hanson. You don't even uh, think that. Gary's just, no, Gary's saying, Gary loves Goodfellas. He's just saying that because he you know it works, gets me worked up. Um, you know, as, as f- there's been, in my opinion, there's been no director that has been able to delve into realistic stories that people haven't really attempted True to do stories. before. True stories, exactly. <laughs> you know, stories that are based on, you know, real events. And put put a, a, some level of sophistication and glamour to them, but at the same time show the actual brutal nature of what actually happened. So here's a good example I use. The difference between Goodfellas and The Godfather, why I think Goodfellas is the epitome of mobster films, and The Godfather is a far second, actually. I love The Godfather, don't get me wrong. But Goodfellas shows what the mafia actually was like. Goodfellas, if you look in interviews with Henry Hill and other guys that are former members of the mafia, they talk about how petty and volatile these mafia members were and how yeah, easily they would shoot you in the fucking head just for looking yeah. at them the wrong way. And you, you know and what? You look at a That's movie... Good. It's okay, hang on. So, and the, you look at a movie Johnny's like on God, a rant here. Let him go. I am. But you look at a movie like The Godfather and it shows that these mafia members were... They stuck to a strict code of honor and ethics. And there was, there was, there was honor in being part of the mafia, and it was almost like being a, a fucking samurai or something, you know, like you had. And that's not true. That's just the glitz and the glamour. And there's, there's a lot of books. There's a lot of theories on this from like film professors at, you know, at NYU and USC. You see, like, um, so it's. Oh, it's I just, can't wait to jump in on this. It, I, it's so I'm done with that part. I'll let you guys jump in. There's other. I'll go into other stuff. Well, oh, no, no. Okay, finish, finish your thought. No, that that was that was it. Uh, Scorsese was just so good at bringing yeah, all of these stories to life and absolutely. staying true to what actually happened. Um, I was reading another article, a couple articles on the Wolf of Wall Street and Jordan Belfour had chimed in and he was like, look, I'm I'm ashamed to admit it, but this movie is about 90, 95% correct. He was like, all of this stuff, you know... Take uh, some quaaludes. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the amount of drugs I was partaking in each day, the way that we all saw ourselves, the way that we took advantage of the American middle working class to get to where we were, uh, all the all the parties, you know... Uh, yeah, well, also he has books to go off of. Right. All, all, all of his movies are based off books, except for a couple early ones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, 
but so anyway, so that that was my rant on the first portion of that. So okay, yeah, jump I, in I, I have I have uh, so you were, you were comparing Goodfellas to Godfather. The Absolutely. thing is, though, um, first of all, uh, are you familiar with actual mobster Michael uh, Franchese? I don't think I've ever heard of Michael Franchese. He, he he's been very public lately, mm-hmm. going doing interviews and such on on uh, other podcasts and radios and whatnot. He 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 was a mobster in the. I forgot which crime. One of the five main New York crime families. Was it the the Gam the Gambi- the Gambinos or? Uh, no, nah, it's not that one. They, um, I forgot. I forgot, but he he said he knew him. Henry Hill and uh-huh. everything. And uh, he also says that Godfather is very realistic. Yeah, because I wonder All if. Right. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, different yeah, different uh, decades too. You have to remember that. You different. Know, well, no. Here, 40s, here's, 50s, here's 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 the main thing. Sixties, eighties. Uh, Godfather is about the actual crime family members themselves. The Don, the, the higher up the rankings, underboss, right? The higher yeah. rankings, not the low low, uh, not the street yeah. associates. As they all all, all the uh, all the show. Where are they called the. Well, there's the you have your capos, you have your yeah the capos under, under capos. That, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Consolier. Yeah, it, it goes from, from top. From top is the don, the boss. Then there's the under boss. Right. Then there's the capos. Then uh, there's the lawyer guy. I forgot what he's called. Now, cons- Goodfellas, the yeah. they're not actual members of the crime family. They're they're they were soldiers that Associates. were under a capo. Associates. Yeah. 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 Um, so well, so, so they, they are so, so they are a big members there. No, that uh, and, and Godfather, you're right. The guys who make the the shot who call the shot callers, right? Pretty much. And I, I understand, and I understand that, but and, and no, that but actually they are a part of the family. They are, they are still they're not they they can't be made men because they're not. Yeah, they well, what I'm saying is that back. they're the guys who do the dirty work and bring in the money. Didn't and do Joe all Pesci that become stuff. a made man? No, they are you being serious right now? They tricked him. That's how they killed him. Oh, but they I mean, told yeah. him he was going to become a made man. And they, spoiler alert! <laughs> um, uh, also, and Michael Franchese says that it was actually John Gotti who killed him himself. John in, got, in the, Gotti. That's Allegedly. right. That's right. I, I remember. I remember seeing that in an interview the other day. Actually, yeah, when I was looking it up. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's probably a, there's probably a little more, there's probably a little more structure, obviously, in how people, uh, how people are organized with everything up towards the top with the boss and the underboss and the, con- mm-hmm. and the consigliere. Um, but that's the, that's they, the one they also talk. Sure. And so Henry Hill had also said the guy that Goodfellas is based off of, for those of you that don't know, um, he had actually said, you know, uh, Paul Cicero, the guy who was the, who was the boss of, of that family. He had actually been with him multiple times, and he had seen him get out of the car before and just grab a baseball bat or grab a fucking pair of brass knuckles mm. or the butt of a sh- sawed-off shotgun, and he would just walk into whatever business where he was pissed off at somebody and literally beat them with an in- inch of their life. So my point is that e- even though I know they're both both films are focusing on different levels of the mob itself— Goodfellas showed the brutality of what is yeah. actually there. That's something that, and granted, now The Godfather was, you know, 20 years prior to this, so there's limits on what they could actually show. As we know, every decade brings about more and more violence and gore um, with what you're able to show. But The Godfather was, if you if you look at it, it's very it's very operatic, and it's it's set up kind of like a show in three acts almost, um, you know, almost, almost Shakespearean, if you will, and it's very very it's real you know it's it's very here's here's the glamour of this but you know goodfellas for me i i feel it's the same thing with the departed um it's a and casino you know casinos actually they talk about casino being like the mid-tier one they say goodfellas is the lowest level casino is the middle and then like you said godfather's at the top so that that's just for me and it's you know it's yeah. t-shirt on what they enjoy more can you tell that johnny likes goodfellas Oh, dude, I, I love Goodfellas. <laughs> it's a great movie. Um, uh, it's such a great movie. Uh, now, uh, you said earlier Taxi Driver is his most overrated movie, which I totally mm-hmm. agree with you, but I'm not going to get into that. It, it, that that's uh, that's another... Or I said, uh, did I say I agree? I, uh, I disagree with you. You disagree with that one, I think, is what is. Is I what t- Absolutely. I love that movie. But 
You know what I fun. say his most underrated right. movie is? Sure. Kingdom of Comedy. Oh, dude. I would probably have to agree with you. I, I That's such a great film. I haven't seen King of Comedy in probably six or seven years, but I mean, yeah. I, I rewatched it when Joker came out. Oh, did you? Oh, man. Yeah, because, I mean, Joker is half Taxi Driver, half King of Comedy. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's no denying that. And, and I, you, sorry, um, I have a friend. Actually, no, obviously you know him, but Lucas. Sure. Um, yeah. I was about to say, I have a friend, but I, I just realized who I'm talking to. Uh, <laughs> our, our mutual friend, he he keeps talking about how overrated Robert De Niro is because he keeps playing the same character over nope. and over Robert, again. Robert De Niro has, he, nope. I can't, I can't, I can't disagree with that more. In mafia movies, sure. Why the hell yeah. would he not? But and, and uh, yes, yeah, so he says, "Oh yeah, he always plays the same character." I just say, "Hey, game of comedy." Yeah, no, you're and you're right, you know. Um, but you know, if you and, but then to to even to say that even like you know you you look at other films of Scorsese's that people just forgot that he directed. I mean, how many people do you know? If I picked out ten people from the mall and said, "Have you seen Raging Bull?" They're like. Probably no. I would say seven or eight of them. There's would say, nobody in the mall right no, now. Okay, Gary. Seven or eight of them would say no. I have never. <laughs> I've never seen that before. And maybe two of them have, but they've probably the majority of them have probably heard of it if they're over the age of 25. You know. Um. You know. And you look. God. You look at. I mean. I think Wolf of Wall Street actually was his best shot film. Um. And it is. It is one of my favorite movies of his. Um. He just. Scorsese just has such a good job. He does such a good job of keeping the tempo. And he'll like he keeps the tempo going, so you're super super stressed, and then he slows it down for about twenty minutes to let you catch your breath, and you can start processing and analyzing the stuff you just saw for the last forty five minutes. And then he goes again, and he keeps coming, and he keeps coming. You said you hated that Gary when we saw Uncut Gems, that Adam Sandler movie, that that movie didn't give you enough time to breathe. Yeah, okay? absolutely. Yeah, I've been meaning yeah. to see that one. It's it was actually pretty good. Um, but I agree with Gary. It's it's that same thing. Yeah. It's because you you can't just have the same emotion the entire movie. Right. Because it, it burn it burns uh, burns people out. It does. It does. You know. Um. And I think he's he's very good when he he does just like Spielberg. He's just a natural storyteller. And I think he's 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 I think yeah I think he's he's the epitome of of being able to to do that. Um. And he just God he just takes such interesting concepts and then turns them into these brutal lashings you know i mean you look at gangs new york which is one of my favorite of his um the this the this contrast between that and a movie like hugo it which that was his first foray into children's films actually in 2011 that was actually that was a delightful very endearing film um yeah. i love that one i mean was, i haven't seen that one it was it was good it had ben kingsley um and i don't remember anybody else noteworthy in it but he basically it's it's this orphan kid who lives in a train station and he basically befriends this little girl and it's very wholesome but it still has the scorsese type storytelling there's still a lot of drama and there's still a lot of you're on the edge of your seat what the hell's going to happen next and i had never seen that really in a a few children's movies you know maybe but um you know between that you said you know king of comedy is another great example um so for me He's just able to, he's proven time and time again that he's able to jump into other genres outside of the mafia world. He's not only just done, you know, Casino, Goodfellas, and The Departed are not the only three movies he's done that are fantastic, that are in, you know, my personal yeah. top 50 list. Uh, so. I, I saw, I actually saw one. I don't know why it took me so long to see this movie, but somebody showed it to me recently. Uh, I think it was After Hours. After Hours. Um... Okay. That's I an don't early think I'm Scorsese movie. One. Okay, very early. Uh, it, it's it's bizarre. Yeah, it's his most unknown movie, pretty much, and mm. it's so good. And it's so different too. It, it's it's pretty much just a series of unfortunate events, just in a row, over and over and over again, to this one guy mm. who's just he starts out the night trying to get laid, and then just problems just happen. And, We've all uh, been there before. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a month there one night. <laughs> uh, yeah, you should you should definitely check it out. Okay, it, it, after hours, it's nuts. And, and Cheech and Chong are in it too. Perfect. Well, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. Did you know that Tommy Chong was actually Jordan Belfort's? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, his I was going to bring that mate? up earlier. Yeah, he, when, when Belfort was in prison for like twenty for those twenty two months for money laundering and and all that. Oh. Uh, and then Tommy Chong was like, "Dude, you have to." 
document your entire life. Yeah. You have to tell people yeah, your story. Work, work yeah. For Tommy Chung. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not going to exactly. pay off the $110 million you owe the United States government just by sitting here and giving seminars on sales. Like you're going to have to do book deals and sign these, these film rights and then give your money to the government. Anyways. Um, yeah. So, so that's, so, so that's, so that's mine. I think, uh, uh, Gary, what, what do you think on that? You didn't, it was really Ian and I going back and forth. Oh, no, that. I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I would say that um, Goodfellas is a fantastic movie. Um, I really like The Departed, though, um, in terms of how it's clever it is. One of his best films. Um, and then um, Gangs of New York, uh, you know. Yeah, I love Gangs of New York so much. Oh. I mean, that that's a, a really well told, like all of his stories are very, very well told. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, he collaborates a lot with people on that. And I think that he has, throughout his career, maintained a very high level of consistency. Because, um, yeah. um, you know, we talked about Spielberg kind of not, in the last 15 years, really pushing himself too much. But I think Scorsese uh, still continues to, uh, to, to challenge himself. When he makes Dude, movies. Scorsese almost murdered a guy because, like, the producer, because, like, the, uh, sorry, uh, Taxi Driver was almost not able to be made. I heard that. Really? I know. I, I yeah. haven't heard that at all. So, like, he, he, uh, allegedly uh, almost murdered Allegedly. Guy. Yeah. I, I, I forgot what the, the, like, one of the producers or something said that, yeah, this movie is too much. It's too dark or something like that. So, mm. Scorsese just got drunk one night and like was loading his gun and his friends had to stop him from like murdering this guy. <laughs> We've all been there before. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, I think we've all made a pretty good case in point for who we think the, the greatest director of all time is, or at least our favorite directors. Uh, like, comment below at the bottom and let us know where you guys fare. Uh, I think, you know, we can all, you can make a case in point for a couple other people outside of, yeah. we said the Coen brothers, Tarantino, yeah. Frank Capra, Frank, Frank Capra, you know, David Fincher. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot there. There's a ton. So let's change gears okay. really quick. Uh, change here we, gears. Here we go. That sounded more like you were cocking a gun. That's how my gearbox but, sounds. You should get that checked I by should. a mechanic. <laughs> yes, I should. Hey, it's almost like yeah. you can. Yeah. Because you own an auto shop. I do. Isn't yeah. that weird? What's the name of that auto shop? It's Revs Automotive in Austin, oh, you Texas. You can't do that. You can't make oh, it. Oh. You can't make I'll, a I'll bleep that for, out. Okay. okay. Yeah. They're not one of our sponsors. Okay. They should be. But they should not. be. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. It costs a lot of money to make these podcasts. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, let's switch gears to our most overrated directors of all time. Um, Ian, since you are the guest, I will defer to you first. Who you got? Are you, are you, are you sure you want me to go first? I would love for you to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Cause, yeah, yeah we, we talked about this already. We did. Um, yeah, wait. I, I, I can't, because I got two in mind. And Bring them both out. Which, which one are, offends you the most? Because I already told you. <laughs> you know, I think the one that I think will offend me the most may not offend Gary as much. So why don't you go ahead and bring both out? It's okay. cool. Okay. Both out. I don't know who they are, so this will be a surprise. Yeah. Oh, we got Judd Apatow. Mm. Okay. And Christopher Nolan. Okay. Yeah. Both of them highly <laughs> overrated. I'll agree to that. Anybody have a problem here? Okay. Okay, cool. good. All okay. right, moving, moving on. Moving on. Well, <laughs> yeah. that was boring as fuck. <laughs> I would have rather listened to you talk about taxes and progress I know, progressive yeah. taxes on the whatever. I don't know. Um, okay. All right. All right. Lay, lay it out for me. Why is Judd Apatow overrated for you? You know, I, both of them I give for the same reason. Okay. And, Great. All fun. right. So with our, our three of us, we chose directors that have one thing in common. All their movies are different genres, and they're all very different. And they're diverse. Great storytelling Absolutely. and everything. These two guys made the same movie over and over again with the same cast, with the same everything, the same theme, everything. It's just the same movie, just different script. And I mean, they're they're all great movies. I I, I love every Christopher Nolan movie, but I mean, it's all. Why the do you same. think he's overrated then? Because it's all the same. So, just to clarify, Pretty, just, just because we're saying somebody's overrated doesn't mean they're not good. It just means we don't think yeah. they're as good as people think they are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I don't, I don't think that Christopher Nolan deserves the credit that he's given. I mean, they're great movies, but it, it's just he he just does the same thing over and over again. Like he, he found out what works 
was great. And he's like, well, I'm just going to do it again and slap a new title on it. He doesn't even change the cast. And so I don't know, I kind of have a problem with that. He did uh, uh, Interstellar. Like, like t- he t- did t- Interstellar. take, take, oh, okay. Well, take all the Batman movies. Okay. And then Medi- mediocre outside of Dark Knight. Yeah. Um, the, then get the prestige. It's the exact same movie. It's the the what? hero is trying to overcome uh, an obstacle with a villain, and then he has Michael Caine telling him, "Oh, I disagree with your methods, but I'm going to support you anyway." Hey, he doesn't use Michael Caine in every movie. Inception. Did you ever see? Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was, he was the he was the antagonist father in Inception. No, but man, that's that's the same exact story for every hero versus villain, you know, super superhero film. Like it, it you know, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's that's unfair. That's like saying uh, that, and, and Michael you Caine know? tells us what the plot is by talking to the protagonist through it's, flashbacks. It's like and Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, man, but that's that's. Okay, I mean, I see what you're saying, but in, I don't know. I think that's a, that's a little too broad of a. I mean, I, I could get more on board with Judd Apatow than I could Christopher Nolan. Yeah. Um, also, same movie over and over again with the same cast. I did like Train. Uh, they're all romantic comedies. He produced it. I don't think he with, oh. with uh, yeah, all of his movies are romantic comedies with Seth Rogen. And I wouldn't say they're romantic comedies. Like they're comedies name. with a romance with a secondary romance aspect. But I, you know, I mean, here's the thing. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put Judd Apatow. I mean, I'd put Christopher Nolan close to you know you know if you're talking about greatest directors of all time. If you actually wanted to make an argument for one, I could see maybe a minor argument being made for Nolan. But yeah, Judd Apatow, he hangs his hat on on comedies. You know, like uh, you know Her- Harold Ramis was a fantastic writer. You know, uh, he was a fantastic comedic director, you know, uh, John Hughes, same thing. He was fantastic at writing the, the coming of teenage dramas and stuff. And that's what he hung his hat on. And that's primarily like they, they, all those directors had their genres and they were very good at it. Um, I mean, I, if, if we're in the argument for best overall director, like who can, who can hop between genres and do a good job no matter what type of movie they're directing, then yeah, I would say those guys are out. But if we're just talking about, you know, is Spielberg going to be a better comedic director than Judd Apatow? I don't think so. But, I mean, it, but, but, it's a spectrum you're looking through. But I mean, like, um, would you, do people say, oh man, Judd Apatow, that is an amazing director. I mean, because, I mean, like, they're like, oh, you know, he's got a movie out, it's probably going to be funny, you know. So I don't, I don't know if I would... The only problem I have with your argument there is I don't know if Judd Apatow is highly rated on people's opinions yeah, of directors. Good. I could well, agree, I could agree with you. A lot of people love him, so it, it makes him overrated in people's eyes who don't find him, hold him to the same level, the same okay pedestal. You know. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, that that is the exact reason why I didn't go with Tim Burton or Michael Bay. That's too easy because those two are too yeah, easy. Yeah. Well, also <laughs> uh, they're, they're so hated these days. So who, it's like who hates Tim they're, Burton? What? Who hates Tim Burton? I hate Tim Burton. Why do you hate Tim Burton? <laughs> Have you seen the new Alice in Wonderland, the new Dumbo movie yeah. that's coming? Have T- you seen See, it? Tim Burton used to be really good. Tim Burton was fantastic. Beetlejuice and the first two Batmans yeah. were fantastic yeah. movies. You know, Batman and Batman Returns yeah. were both great. Uh, Edward Scissorhands was, was, was fantastic. Great. Big Fish was but great. But that, that is just like, uh, again, same with what I said about the other guys. Same movie over and over again with the same cast and the same theme. <laughs> I don't. I, you know, if you look at that man, I mean, because you you look at a guy like so look at Scorsese. You know, he always uses De Niro and Pesci, De Niro in particular, and Harvey Keitel. Like those are his guys. He uses them in every movie for yeah, the first three years. Leonardo DiCaprio, and now it's Leonardo yeah, but DiCaprio, they're, they're all. Know? I I'd say that the only Scorsese movies mm-hmm. that are the same would be C- Casino and Goodfellas, and then all the yeah. others are are have very big differences from each other. Except for, I guess you could add Irishman and with that too. Yeah, I mean Irishman, I thought was but, actually one of his more overrated. But anyways, yeah, I didn't like Irishman. At it was all. just it, it wasn't the fact that it was long. It just it's we'll pretty much like day. it should it should have been called Robert De Niro. I'm old. The movie <laughs> that could be any movie he's in. He's looked he's looked seventy since I mean, he was twenty five. Let's him. be honest. The movie's about him being right. old. 
So, okay, so I mean, so with Judd Apatow, I, I can see what you're saying. I, I, I disagree with the Christopher Nolan aspect. Yeah, he definitely, he, he does tend to have a lot of the same people in his films. I feel like a lot of established directors do that, though. Yeah. I mean, hell, J- you know, you know, James Wan. Well, I mean, you, it's, it's the same formula, is what I'm saying. Like, Michael Caine is there just to tell the protagonist. Well, that's only I an inception. You, but hey, yeah. I disagree with this one thing yeah. you're doing. Oh, also, yeah. but here's the plot. It's it is for in, in you're right Inception, Interstellar, the Batman movies, and the Prestige. Yeah, there is a lot of similarities in how how the stories <laughs> go. But the stories to me, that type of story for me is is always interesting when he tells it, and and so I'm just a sucker for it. Memento, I thought was one of his probably his most underrated film for sure. I hated That's definitely right. I hated Dunkirk with a passion. I've never really? I've never seen a World War II movie not focus on a story it's literally they're talking about the battle and then they give you all these characters you don't care anything about because you don't know anything about their past they don't talk to any other people and form relationships it's just basically it's it's beautiful shot cinematography planes flying through the air tom hardy somehow gliding in in for the most air, of the movie for like 10 hours or yeah. something when his when his propeller and engine go out and I, it just I could have cared I I could have definitely gone my entire life without seeing it um but and you know the Batman Man of Steel Batman vs Superman you know DC just uh, yeah oh God uh, DC has just destroyed the names uh, for uh, Christopher Nolan and Zack Snyder as both director and producer I just I can't I, I, I will say that Christopher yeah, Nolan in a lot of his movies does like you know inception and interstellar would be the ones that i would think I of loved um I they're it. visually Inter- very- interstellar was just a remake of 2001 space odyssey yes but better yeah but well I- <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. i mean shots fired bro i mean the ball's in your court what are you gonna do i mean they're, they're visually very dynamic and interesting movies to watch at least so i mean i i think he does do a good job of at least hiring a good computer graphic guy True. I mean, yeah. in fact, I, I was reading an interview between, uh, I forgot the name of the guy that is the DP for all of Nolan's films, mm. but he actually said he hates Chris Nolan mm. as a person. He absolutely hates him, but he respects him like mm. no other as a director, and they work so well together that he just keeps yeah. agreeing to and all of his films. I, I don't know if it's the DP or Chris Nolan or a combination of the two that come up with a lot of the shots, like... Inception has so many like really oh. cool shots. Like there's a scene where they're like underneath a, a train and they're like closing mirror, large mirror doors. And then like <laughs> it go, moves into another scene. <laughs> yeah. Like th- it has a lot of really interesting uh, visuals that I, I, I like a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I will oh, say man. the prestige is one of my favorite movies of all time though. Yeah, prestige is 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 fantastic i mean if you've ever seen um is that the one with the twins or is that it the, is the one okay because yeah, with... there's another one that's almost that is a spoiler right. sir. whatever it's 14 years <laughs> you haven't seen it oh. yet you know your your own are bad i guess you know um you know it's it's just what was that one yeah with... that's exactly like that but no oh, no 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 the illusionist the, you yeah, ever see that yeah, with yeah. edward norton paul giamatti and jessica yeah. biel i always um, get those two mixed up yeah uh, uh i don't think i saw that the one. illusionist what well, not as good as the prestige but also another fantastic film highly underrated anyways another a uh, story for another day so okay uh gary how about you most underrated uh overrated, overrated excuse me director of all time uh, I'm gonna go with Ari Aster. He's a uh, oh, a new, new age. Yeah, he, he's a, a. Is a, that fair though? The guy's only done like two or three films so far. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, because uh, uh, who is that? Ari Aster. He directed <laughs> uh, the I films Hereditary and Midsummer. Uh, he he sort of just come uh, up on the scene okay. uh, recently. Everybody, lo- every everybody our age that considers himself a film buff or all the artsy fartsy people really love him. Just and love these like people. hated both of them. Midsummer. I like. Yeah, I heard good things about it. I, I haven't seen any. Of course, of you heard good Midsummer. Things, I think was the worst <laughs> movie I've ever seen. Um, really? I might have. Yeah, I think I might have. Independence seen. Day resurgence. Yeah. At least Independence yeah. Day resurgence had what? moments yeah. where aliens' heads blew up, and I'm like, hey, that's kind of cool. I mean, it, it's because it, it's like to to me. I I think Ian uh, like it's like you know it's like somebody who's trying to have a creative vision. The st- like to the degree of Stanley Kubrick, but it's, it just, it really falls flat on its face. Like an old person walking off a cliff and dying, which is in the movie. (laughs) (laughs) 
a horrible analogy. <laughs> well, I was trying to reference the movie. I, I don't know. I, 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 I dig it. So here, and, and you're right. There's a good yeah. reference to the movie. Look, uh, you know, and and this Ari Aster. Funny enough, you say that Ari Aster is exactly the type of director that I was talking about that was influenced by the Kubrick style. And I, I'm sure this guy was, you know, he was probably influenced by some fantastic European art director or something that moved him to the point of tears where he saw his soul from, you know, he saw his human body from above. Yeah, his, the astronomical in, in the, plane. Yeah, exactly. It, I don't know. Um and look, I mean, it's I'm not dead. The the to get to this point in Hollywood is so difficult. These guys are obviously talented people. I mean, no one's saying that. We just don't like their directing style, the style of movie they're directing. It doesn't mean that other people don't. Um, people can like shit. That's fine. They can. That's their they, that's their they, right. If they want to, yeah, exactly. You know, it's like trying to put lipstick on a pig. You know, it just it doesn't yeah, work. It's, um, man, why do I keep hearing that all the time? Lipstick on a pig. Yeah, I, I've. It's just like, it's an old I saying. Curious, I don't know, but like it's a saying that means trying to dress up something. No, to, I, oh, I, no he, I, I think he knows it, what but, it means, but oh. uh, no, it's just all of a sudden I keep hearing that everywhere yeah. I go. You know, like, every day with with a guy like Ari Aster, he's actually he's our age. He's 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 thirty three. Um, so a young kid, a uh, young a young guy uh, who who's who's probably going to young. You, you see a lot of. Isn't it his 30s? Yeah. He's young. If, if you see a lot of directors like that over time, and you see that with directors now that are in their 70, 60s, 70s, 80s, their style of directing stays true to itself for the most part, but it does it changes and evolves with time. So maybe he'll do some stuff coming out in the future, because he'll definitely get... I guarantee you, this guy did a couple movies with A24, who has a production company I really like, mm -hmm. um, except for some of this stuff they've come out with, Midsummer and, and Hereditary being the two. Um, he'll probably get a break with another big budget blockbuster and he'll either knock it out of the park and everybody will know the name or he'll completely fall on his face and he'll do nothing but, you know, yeah, stuff. B-grade pornos B -rated, after this. No, thing. just like just B-rated film uh, after that. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where did he fly too close to the sun for some people at the beginning or not? I personally, I, I gotta agree with you. I, I thought Midsummer was probably... I mean, I would have rather listened to, you know, nails on a chalkboard mm -hmm. being scr scratched across for three hours straight. Um, it, it was just a horribly long, boring, stupid movie. Yeah. Um, and I love we love horror movies, love psychological thrillers. But, you know, Hereditary, I actually, where Gary and I differ, I loved Hereditary up until the first the last, two thirds. Yeah. The first two thirds, up until the last yeah. 30, 45 minutes of the movie. I was really into it. Yeah. I was like, man, I was like, cool. Like, there's going to be like, you know, this demon is chasing them and it has something to do with the genealogy. And, or is there a demon or is she just going, like, or she's yeah. going nuts? Exactly. Yeah. You know, love, love films like that. And then I, this one's kind of new, so I won't spoil the end on, on Hereditary because it just came out two years ago. Um, but it, it's that same thing. It's like, you know, you see the end and you're just like, this is it. Like, this is what they were building up to. This is just out of left field. You know, like, I... This just... It seems like they didn't know where to go after an hour and a half, and so they're just like, okay, let's veer direction really quick, and let's let's just hit mm. it. So... Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, Ian, if you want to... I mean, you might like it. It's It's... Those movies are said to be the very... I wouldn't even call them, like, artful, or, you know, I wouldn't say that the creative direction in them was beautiful and it was like as you so eloquently put it earlier a moving painting um i wouldn't necessarily either of these were like that but they're in that same spectrum so i don't know you might you might like them you may disagree with us um Maybe. but for, uh, i'll go, i'll come back if i do yeah, okay absolutely. all right like, you sir are full of shit <laughs> <laughs> you sir can go to hell um well, johnny uh, who who's your most overrated director oh god i mean i'm gonna have to say it would absolutely be you know Someone like Clint Eastwood yeah. or Mel, what? Mel Gibson. Yeah. Or I'm totally kidding. That's a, that's an absolute joke. Uh, no, by far. And, and the fact that no one has <laughs> said this yet is just driving me nuts. M. Night motherfucking Shyamalan. Okay? Well, M. Night Shyamalan. Outside of, l listen, outside of the sixth sense, the guy hasn't done anything of worth of value. I thought Signs was okay. I, I like thought Signs. Un I thought Unbreakable was passable. I suppose I, I liked Unbreakable you too, know? but I mean, the happening even even the crappening that is one of the worst. That, that movie is worse than Midsummer. <laughs> no, in my it's no way. Now, Lady in the Water that's is his another one I haven't seen because everybody told me how shitty it was. I never bothered. Just to don't. See it. It's it, not worth it. It, it's it's just so it, it is not a good movie. 
but it's <laughs> better than Midsummer. L- Lady in the Water is probably his worst one, I would have to say. Uh, the Happening and Lady in the Water, they're both horrible. Um, the Visit, the one about the grandparents. That, that one, we were cracking up. We were. That one made me laugh a lot. It, it wasn't supposed to be a comedy, Look, by the way. Look, you know, M. Night Shyamalan, he got... He, it was it was one of those same things. He was one of those directors that he became hot right out of the gate with Sixth Sense, which Sixth Sense, you know, for the time yeah. was something people had never seen before. And I still to this day love that movie. You know, I mean, that is one of the movies that it mixes a solid storyline, suspense and metaphorical and, and, and like, yeah, and beauty and like the symbolism of what they're trying to get across through what we talked about, like the color patterns and the you, shot of the film. You know, film. it's funny. What? With that movie, it, it starts mm. out with the spoiler. It tells you exactly what happens, right. and it, you just forget really, about yeah. it. And people it's just like a Columbo Pe- episode. Yeah, and people just they're just like, oh, he he must be okay. Like you know, he got shot. <laughs> it's yeah. fine. He got shot in the stomach. He got shot in a major vital organ, and he's bleeding Dude, out. Perfu- the first time it's I cool. saw it, I thought I thought that was j- uh, like a grown up Jaylee Hole. Uh, Osmond or whatever. Haley Joel Osmond, yeah. And then, I, I th- and then I it the went into flashback. That's yeah. what I thought at first. I, I, w- I was right there with you. I was the same thing. But, you know, he, what was so, what people loved about it so much was the fact that they were like, oh, the twist at the end is amazing and it's never been done before. And yeah, I mean, I And def- then he just, he fucking went he's, crazy. With yeah, that he's dead the entire movie. time. If you've never seen Six <laughs> Sense, it's been over 20 years. Go see it, okay? <laughs> Not my fault that I spoiled it. Um, but it's, <laughs> he, he, he did do a movie recently. Well, I think he was just a producer on it a couple of years ago called Devil. I remember you talking about the people Devil. trapped in an elevator. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that was a pretty interesting movie. I, I'm not really sure how much um, well, he produced. He, it, he did with that. Yeah, but uh, I thought that one was pretty I'm interesting. Not... And I, I'll also give him credit because um, when he did Unbreakable, and then he uh, so he, he followed that up with. Um, Fine. Well, what's the multiple personality guy? Well, um, Split was yeah. like twelve. Split was like Split. fourteen. Right. Years yeah, yeah. Like and and, years and then that was actually part of the same universe. Sure. See, it was. Yeah. Okay, I have a lot to say about Split. Sure. Split started out a great movie. Yeah, it actually did. And but when he became the Beast, mm-hmm. it just it got silly. What? Like what? <laughs> Is it he a, took a shotgun to the chest. He's like, oh, ha, ha, ha. I'm good, bro. It's fine. Yeah. And, and like, it, I mean, it, it started out very realistic, but also not. But, I mean, it's still grounded in reality. Then all, mm. all of a sudden he's climbing walls and shit. Right. And I was just like, what the fuck am I watching now? He, and, right. then, and then it showed Bruce Willis at the very end. He's like, Mr. Glass. I straight up laughed in the theater. I was That's I was laughing that. pretty I, I was laughing pretty hard myself. It's just like Shyamalan with his scripts because you know he writes a lot of the movies he that pretty much all the movies that he directs, and it's kind of like he he gets really excited about one idea. It's like a it's like a dog trying to choose a treat or a toy to play with, you know, or it's like a kid in a candy shop or whatever, you know. He's just it's like the ADHD is just you know it's just it's just going everywhere. He's like I love this idea. Oh wait. But after yeah. 15 that, minutes of dialogue yeah, here, good to I've got to go this route. And he just keeps switching direction. And then once he gets to the end of the script, he's got a deadline that he has to meet with the producers probably, mm-hmm. I guess. And he's like, well, i got to figure out a twist at the end because that's what I'm known for. That's my calling card. And then he just puts it, he slaps something generic on it, and it's not creative. You know, he everyone was like, M. Night Shyamalan is the king of plot twists and he is the king of throwing you a curveball at the end that still was hinted throughout the course of the script, throughout the storyline. And like I, the in village. my opinion, I, I just think Sixth Sense was the only one that that hit home on it. Um, I mean, like I said, I thought Signs is my second favorite movie of his. Um, I, I mean, I thought it was I thought it was okay. Uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was just it was just an, does, an entertaining it does story. Have plot holes. Yeah, it has a huge bunch of plot holes. Um, and I, but you know, with swing away, Meryl. Swing away, Meryl. Swing, swing away. away. Maybe it's because I I love Mel Gibson and yeah. Joaquin Phoenix so much. Maybe that was the biggest thing. Um, but for me, man, it's it's just he was a guy that he he had one good film, and then every single time he's come out with something else, everybody just goes nuts over it because they're like, oh, this is going to be the next Sixth Sense. It's like we talk about Peter Jackson all the time doing yeah. the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm-hmm. What the hell has he done since then that's been as good? King Kong? Dude. Yeah. The Hobbit? Oh, have, have you seen The Hobbit? Gary, be quiet. Seen, uh, <laughs> have you seen his first, his uh, early movies? Uh, yeah, he had... Have you oh, seen God. Dead Alive? No. I have not seen that one. I, I, oh, my I, God. But I've heard of that one. 
Dead Alive is fucking batshit insane. Is it? And, yeah. Uh, uh, well, for one, it, uh, you, I would compare it to Evil Dead. Uh-huh. It's very similar to Evil Dead. And yeah. it's it holds the record for the most fake blood used in a movie. Really? Producer. Really? It, it wow. is so crazy. Jeez. Also, Meet the Feebles. And uh, there's his first, I forgot the name of his first movie, I heard, but heard it meet the people so insane. Um, and he's you know he's produced some he's produced some good ones. Um, there was a movie called the there was the Lovely Bones and uh, District Nine were okay, you know. Um, but he didn't do District Nine. He he produced it though, like he like he's, he's oh he's, did he's, yeah he did he he's produced some oh, good wow. ones you know and the producers helped the movie out a lot. But I I mean as far as just taking the creative control, but I, I that, just, there's a good director right there, Neil Blomkamp. Yeah, no, Neil Baumkamp is good. Um, so l- l- let me pose this question to you guys, uh, going back to M. Night Shyamala. What do you all think about directors giving themselves cameos in their movies? Johnny, I already know that you are a huge fan of that. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of it, I would say. I mean, they don't have... It's, it's an, it, it pays... You know, it, it's fine. You know, Tarantino always does it. M. Night Shyamalan always does it. Um... You know, Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, Hitchcock did it. Um, Stan Lee. I know that Stan Lee was not directing any of those right. movies, but you know, to pay homage to all the, to him building Marvel, mm-hmm. being the primary builder of it. Um, you know, I, I like paying homage to that. So I don't, I don't have a problem with it as long as it's not one of the main characters in the story. And I think with Signs, that was a big problem because, honest, outside of the aliens, the antagonist was M Night Shyamalan's character, the guy that you know he's the one that fell asleep, yeah. ran over Mel Gibson's wife. And cause Mel Gibson and his family to go on this downslide in, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't necessarily call him an antagonist, but he he's the closest thing to one a, outside a of very aliens. important character. A, a catalyst, that, yeah. That well, and it turned out to be all about fate. So he was right. just uh, his uh, faith was tested. His faith was tested. His faith was tested. No, not not and, faith. No, not faith. Fate. Oh, it was fate that it yeah. happened because of the ice age. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. really, it had nothing to do with him. He just happened to be the guy in the wrong place at the right. wrong time. Right, I, I understand that, and, I, and I, I don't care about the meaning behind it. That's fine. That actually worked out okay. That's one of the few things I liked about it. No, what I care is that M. Night Shyamalan is not a good actor. And oh, see, yeah, seeing him not. in Seeing him in more than one scene and hearing his voice, it just it didn't work for me. You know, like, like yeah. I remember in The Village, you know, you saw his reflection, and he's like the officer in the cabin when Bryce Dallas Howard gets outside of the wall, and she goes to collect medical supplies and stuff. Um, he's just, he's there, yeah. and he's got like three lines of dialogue, and it's fine. Like, that's short. He, he, that. It's like he's trying to be Hitchcock and Scorsese. Like, he sees that they do that, and he's like, oh, I want to do that too, but more than that. Hitchcock and Tarantino, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, I said Scorsese. When does Scorsese make appearances in his films? Dude, and like all of them. He, he's in two appearances what? in Taxi Driver. Well, in Taxi Driver, he, maybe, but he wasn't. He was. I don't ever remember him being in the department. He was in Mean Walter Streets. Or... He was in Mean Streets. Oh, right. well, his earlier movies. He okay. was in Mean Streets. Okay, okay maybe he was in Taxi movies. Driver. Okay. He was in uh, the one that I said that you hadn't seen, mm. uh, After Hours. Yeah, after Hours, yeah, yeah. He, he played okay. Bill the Butcher. That was Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> that wasn't Scorsese? Oh, okay. <laughs> Bill the Butcher? <laughs> But yeah, he, he showed up in his earlier movies. Okay, okay. A lot. Um, and, but yeah, I think you're yeah. right. I think that you know M Night Shyamalan he tries he tries a little too hard, and he really just should he just should take it easy, man. You know, maybe he should just go. He should maybe if if Devil was really great and he just produced that, maybe yeah, he'd just that stick guy to that guy has no creativity. No, he doesn't. He just it's and, it, you know he, he falls in what I was saying with the other guys with Christopher Nolan I was, over I, and over I, again, I but he that. fails way more than those guys yeah. <laughs> you know so so speaking of uh speaking of movies that we think just suck and these movies we're talking about they they're so bad that they are just bad and they blow um let's transition a little bit uh we've got a tiny little segment whenever ian's on the on the show here that he uh he kind of gives us uh a movie so bad that it's good uh summary and recommendation for our listeners to watch so ian what do you got this week uh, I, well, I was gonna before you told me what this was about to be about. I was gonna bring up one which I can actually say to later. Since we're talking about directors, I want to bring up a, sure. a very uh, culty, so bad as good director. Um, he, he's like he's my favorite shitty, terrible director, and I mean that so wholeheartedly. He's the worst, but <laughs> it's hilarious, and okay. I love him. His name is Neil Breen. Right. Um, he he <laughs> he's made the same movie five times. 
Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah! I know Neil. Br- yeah, <laughs> he's those movies are god awful. <laughs> so, so you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you know yeah, yeah. No, no, we're familiar with them. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, he. I call him the poor man's Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> That's an apt description, I would say. That's it's pretty accurate, yeah. Uh, because he's he's very similar to Tommy Wiseau, but worse and cheaper. Ugh. And uh, yeah, so his first three films he made with his architect money. Mm-hmm. He funded himself because okay. he was an, he's actually an architect and a realtor. Wow. And he used his money to do that. Then he ran out of money, so he crowdfunded the next two movies. Uh-huh. Now, he's working on a new one. But crowdfunding is not working out. He does. He has no money at all left over. So he, what he did very recently actually was, uh, he he made a like a making of slash. Uh, this is how you direct a film DVD, <laughs> which is the last guy you want to watch. <laughs> that far. Sure. Um, he he did that, and he's selling it for something like four hundred dollars. What? <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. And, and like everybody is just laughing at him right now, uh, so it um, doesn't look like this movie's gonna get made. A master class from Neil Breen. Fantastic. I, I love yeah. it. To watch that. Oh uh, yeah, it, it, his films. His films are so just bizarre. It, it's like he's trying to be. Um. Uh, david lynch in a way like there's these bizarre dream like things that happen but they don't make any sense and if you ask him about it like i've seen interviews with him where he says oh it just means whatever you want it to me which was the one where he like he goes into like the newscasting room and he's telling all the people they're gonna die (laughs) that's pass through yeah he pretty much becomes thanos in that (laughs) yeah that it's such a like yeah uh so, yeah, so yeah, he he appears in the newsroom and makes a live bro- broadcast to the whole world. He says that he wants to kill all of the corrupt and evil people on the planet. And he says, I have killed, I, I think the number was 60 million people on the evil people on the planet. In Jesus. other terms, I've killed them all. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 60 billion out of 8 billion. <laughs> uh, so Johnny and I may watch one of his movies later tonight just for fun if you could recommend only one of them which one would you tell us to watch I would say Fateful Findings Fateful Findings Okay, that is his third film that's that's definitely the introduction to the Neil Breen the Breeniverse perfect um, <laughs> it, it's the most quotable it's um, I would say it's the most bizarre but they're all so fucking bizarre um, it, it's it's it got the worst act. Oh, it's so hard to say. It's got the worst acting, but it's in the middle. It's it's his middle film. So like his earlier films is where he's trying trying to figure out what he's doing. The later films, he has more of an idea of what he's doing. This is right in the middle. So it's just mm-hmm. he he's clueless as well as he has an idea. Okay, all right, but then. <laughs> so uh, this week's so bad they're good directors is Neil Breen. Neil Breen. All right. Um, did, did you... And so that was the movie you were recommending this week? Was that one? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I guess, yeah. yeah. Faithful Findings. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you like that, definitely check out his other movies. That it, It's definitely so bad. I mean, it's, it's the worst thing you've ever seen in your life, but you, <laughs> you can't take your eyes off of it. It's like a car wreck. I, it's I, like, I, how I, is this acting so bad? Okay, we'll we'll watch that one, and you can ro- watch uh, Midsummer, and we'll compare notes. Oh God, yeah, <laughs> two movies that are just so <laughs> shitty, they're shitty. Oh God! All right. Um. Well, yeah. That uh. That looks about like the amount of time we got for today, guys. Uh, Ian, thanks again for being on, man. It's yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Um. Once again, guys. Uh. Ian Webb, uh, one of the hosts of the podcast, movies so bad they're good, and host of the rapidly growing in popularity Facebook group, movies so bad they're good, Midnight Cult Classics and Camp. Ian, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you for everybody here. I'm Johnny Blackburn. And I'm Gary Elmore. Stay classy, everybody.